today I'm going to talk uh, for a while about the relativistic velocity Maxwell system in uh, 2D and uh, it will start on the uh, with the slides and if there's time we'll uh, do some proofs on the chalkboard at the end. Um, okay so what is uh, 2D relativistic velocity Maxwell? Uh, well, let's start again by reminding you what is 3D relativistic glass of Maxwell. You saw this slide uh, yesterday. It hasn't changed, uh, but I should remind you uh, before we do a dimensional reduction. Um, so you have the uh, transport equation for the density function F, and you have Maxwell's equations for um, the electric and magnetic terms E and B and uh, they have constraints in terms of the divergence of E and B and there's the charge rho and the current J. Um, this is relativistic plus a Maxwell. I'll just let you look at it for a second. Oh, uh, two people have asked me to, uh, if they could see my slides. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to share them. Uh, they're on the computer here. I can also put them on my web page or something. Uh, it might be kind of hard to write everything down. Um, on the other hand, it's hard to say uh, say everything uh, without putting it on slides. So there's a, you have to make a choice, and this is the one I made. Um, but uh, I don't. So uh, what I'm thinking is, don't try to write everything down, and just uh, you can have my slides if you want. Um, okay, so. Uh, to study 2D plus of Maxwell, we make the following ansatz. You uh, consider, uh, that you uh, think of everything as being 2D, so you drop the x3 and the p3 term, and then you have, uh, and you make a further reduction than that. You assume that E is of the form E1, E2, 0, where E is only a function of it, T, x1, and x2, and B is of the form 0, 0, B. Um, where we abuse notation by using b inside the vector and outside the <laughs> vector briefly, um, and b is also only a function of t, x1, and x2, and then uh, f is a function of t, x1, x2, p1, and p2, um, and then you obtain uh, what we call 2D less of Maxwell, uh, which is uh, the, sa the same equation except you see you get a much simpler thing here, it's just e one plus P2B and E2 minus P1B gradient PF and uh, Maxwell's equations simplify a lot. You only have one derivative on the uh, right hand side for each term. Uh, the divergence of B term disappears and you have divergence of E equals rho. Um, and you have the charge in the current again. Uh, except now they're integrated over R2 instead of R3, and everywhere you plug in x is x1, x2, 0, and p is p1, p2, 0, and then this is the equation. I should point out, to be honest, that this is not full 2D relativistic velocity of Maxwell. If you don't make this ansatz at the top, then you get more singular terms. If you just assume everything doesn't depend upon um, the third uh, variable, then you get more singular terms, and for that system, um, as far as I know, zero is really known um, because the more singular terms are actually fairly singular. But um, this is what we're doing, and this uh, reduction is propagated by the uh, system. Um, so we can honestly do two and a half d, so that's uh, better. But this is what you do in two d. And now you also have the 2 and a half t relativistic class of Maxwell. Uh, in this case, um, you just assume that x is of the form x1, x2, 0, and p has the full three variables. Then f, e, and b depend upon uh, t, x1, x2, p1, p2, and p3, respectively. Um, and you have all the uh, components. Um, and you plug this into 3d plus of Maxwell, uh, and you obtain the 2.5d. Plus the Maxwell system, I'll write it down on the next slide. Um, it's important to point out this is 2D in uh, this is 2D in space, but 3D in the momentum. 
And there's an additional conservation law here. So in 2.5D, Klesi uh, and Schaefer in 97 observed that the uh, conservation of the projection of momentum in the P3 direction uh, propagated by the conservation laws is conserved. That means that V3 plus A3 Txv is equal to a constant in time. Uh, what is A3? Well, it says it already on the slide. A3 is a gauge, so you can assume uh, in Maxwell's equations and other systems, you can assume that you have an underlying gauge. Uh, and um, that would be of the form B is equal to the curl of A1, A2, A3. I won't go into the uh, complexities of what it means to uh, assume there exists a gauge, but you can do it. And that's what it is. And then uh, you can show that A3, uh, by the equations that A3 satisfies, you can show that A3 is bounded in time. And that allows you to show that uh, the variation of the V3 uh, characteristic in uh, time. So if you soup over S, T, and R, where you have uh, S is, and T are the time variables that you're changing, and then R is the fixed time variable from the characteristic. These, this variation is bounded. Um, and this is an important conservation law, and it uh, allows you to uh, prove existence in 2.5D. Without this, uh, the, the, proof, uh, the proof really needs this to uh, prove uh, existence and uniqueness. Um, OK, so this is the system. Um, this is lots of max well, in 2.5D. You have uh, partial T, P1, hat. Gradient x part p2 plus p2 hat uh, partial derivative of x, and then you have the Lorentz force dotted with uh, gradient p of f, um, and you have the uh, divergence free condition, the divergence conditions. The divergence of e is equal to rho, and the divergence of b is equal to zero. And uh, then you can do the same reduction for Maxwell's equations, and you get. Um, uh, wave equations for satisfied by E and B in a, and the important thing to notice here is that the well, the wave equations are entirely 2D so um, uh, you have the advantage of working in 2D here which helps and again you have the charge and the current they're the same as in 3D um, okay so uh, this is the point that I want to make is that um, for box u equals f in 2D, where, where the box is just the wave operator that we wrote on the previous slide without the box notation, then you can notice that the solution to the linear inhomogeneous wave equation in R2 with zero initial data is given explicitly by this uh, formula. Uh, so you have, um, so the important point here for us is that you're integrating over an entire uh, interior of a solid cone, you're not just integrating on the boundary. Um, and that allows you to uh, precisely use uh, the conservation laws, uh, whereas uh, in 3D, uh, the similar solution to the uh, wave equation with zero initial data when you invert the box is uh, the integration over, a, uh, over the uh, boundary of the cone. Uh, so you're you're integrating over a lower dimensional region than what you get in the in most of the conservation laws, and that can cause problems when you try to uh, control things. Um, so that helps. Um, so notice the Maxwell's equation is still essentially 2D, um, and uh, then you can integrate over a solid region, and then you can bound more things by the conservation laws, which makes uh, the 2D case uh, easier to solve. Okay. Um, so, so here, what's your yes. point about those two four? I mean, like you are saying. I'm saying that integrating over the boundary of a uh, cone in 3D it makes it harder to control um, stuff. I'm being vague about what I mean by stuff, by the conservation laws. Um, you can still do it in some cases. In particular, using the good using the good conservation law, but in 2D you're integrating over a solid region. This is a 2D region, um, and so you can uh, when you do LP estimates and you have these uh, when you do have these ST decompositions, uh, 
then you can bound more stuff uh, by conservation laws, and then you have less um, stuff to worry about how to bound. Um, so even though in general we think that in 3D we have more decay, so here it's, it's somehow different, but it's not... Yes, this is not a statement about decay, th so that's right. So you can also think about uh, some, sometimes when you do uh, dispersive problems, you talk about uh, in uh, 3D you have more decay than in 2D, and that helps you when you're trying to close estimates and improve global existence problems. This is a different phenomenon. The phenomenon is that um, when you do these ST decompositions and you have uh, expressions for E and B that are on the next slide in terms of uh, integrals, uh, and then you have the conservation laws that I talked about last time, then in, uh, in 2D you don't have a Huygens principle and you have uh, an in the the inverse of the box I is a uh, integral over a, a solid region, and that <laughs> gives you better control in terms of the conservation laws um, that enables you to prove uh, global existence. So yeah, we would like to uh, have um, decay. I mean, what were the kind of things we do in this business um, for uh, without making a size assumption on the uh, data? give you bounds that are very, very far away from decay, and uh, I'll talk about them later, too. Okay? Good. Okay, so... So, this uh, Glassy-Strauss 1986 paper introduced this uh, ST decomposition that I talked about last time, and it uh, gave us a... Uh, and then there were sub subsequent decompositions uh, that I also talked about last time. Um, and it gave us a way to uh, express the fields <coughs> in terms of integrals that are not uh, derivatives. It gave us a way to do estimates. And then uh, in 1988, Glassy Schaefer wrote a, a conditional paper proving uh, stuff uh, about a conditional uh, existence and uniqueness for 2D and 2.5D uh, loss of Maxwell. And they, but they were unable to prove, the, and they used the 3D ST decomposition, and they, they, with this approach, they were unable to prove uh, unconditional global existence and uniqueness. Um, and it took about 10 years to realize, uh, for them to come out with a uh, better decomposition. So the 3D ST decomposition is not really the right thing to do in 2D. Uh, because of this phenomenon that I talked about on the previous slide, that you're actually, when you invert the box, you're integrating over a uh, solid region, and uh, so you, they had this alternate decomposition, so the S is the same, it's just the uh, transport operator in 2D, and then the T is uh, not the same, you have this uh, Z, which is Y minus X over T minus tau, this is a unit vector, on the boundary of the 2D cone, it's not a unit vector on the interior. And then you renormalize for a certain uh, regime and you get partial x minus c partial t uh, times this uh, weight function in terms of c. And uh, with this decomposition, integration by parts can be performed on the interior of the backward wave cone in 2D. If you go back to the 3D decomposition here, uh, you're basically, this is it, I won't read it to you again, but here the integration by parts is on the lateral surface of a characteristic cone, so it's not on the full interior, it's just on uh, uh, lateral surfaces. Um, and the uh, 2D ST decomposition has better cancellation properties with respect to the box, and so you get lower order singularities in your final expressions that you get. So again, you, uh, what you're doing here is you're inverting, you have uh, the wave equations for Maxwell. For Maxwell's equations, you invert the box, and then you get these derivatives on the right-hand side. You express them in terms of these uh, ST variables, and you integrate by parts, and then you can decompose uh, the fields uh, E and B. So you can express E as EI0, EIS, and EIT. And you can similarly express B, which I won't 
write down carefully where the E0 and the B0 terms are functions of the initial data. And uh, EIT has this form. Um, so EIT is, uh, this is, it's the T term, it's the term that you get from the applying the divergence theorem to the T operator. And it's F over the, uh, the wave uh, kernel, except you get this extra T minus S term here. And then you get this, uh, this complicated uh, polynomial type expression, uh, 1 minus P hat squared Xi Pi, 1 plus P hat dot Xi. I want to explain these expressions last time, but instead I'll explain them today. You get a similar but worse expression for ES. So you have this ESI thing, which is this complicated uh, polynomial. And then you dot that with the Lorentz fourth times F, and you divide by the wave kernel in 2D. So this is uh, the ET term is uh, linear in F, uh, but more singular. And the e, uh, S term is not linear, but it has structure. Um, so um, yeah, so I wanted to just explain quickly, um, or not so quickly. Oh, Chuck is over here. What you get with these expressions. So how do you estimate these things? Uh, so recall, C is um, y minus x over t minus s, and um, is a univector on is a univector on the boundary of the cone you're integrating over, but um, it's smaller than that on the interior. And if you take C equal to minus P over P, which you can do uh, on the boundary, then um, 1 plus P hat dot C, which is these singularities that you get in the denominator, denominator up there is of the form 1 minus absolute value of P over P0. And you can calculate this exactly complete the square um, and you get that 1 minus absolute value p over p0 is p0 minus absolute value p over p0 which is p0 squared minus absolute value of p of squared over p0 times uh, p plus absolute value p and this is uh, 1 over p0 p0 plus absolute value p and this is greater than or equal to 1 over p0 squared. Um, so this gives you uh, the, the bad news. Um, and the bad news is that I claimed this last time, but I didn't prove it. So there is the quick proof. Um, so the bad news is that 1 plus p hat dot c to the minus 1 is like 1 over, is like p0 squared. So you see that in all of these terms, you have a 1 plus p hat got c squared. And uh, that gives you bad growth. So the worst growth is uh, p0 to the fourth. And the other terms are have less growth. You have like p0 cubed and p0 growth um, in these different terms. And that's uh, really bad, because if you want to bound um, the fields, you don't want to lose momentum growth. So this causes big problems. Um, but it's not a death sentence um, because the numerators also have cancellation that's hiding. And I want to uh, explain this. Um, so uh, 
So you have cancellation. In particular, you have uh, the easiest one is 1 minus p hat squared. Uh, this is actually very similar to what we just did. It's um, p0 squared minus p squared over p0 squared, which is 1 over p0 squared. So there's a, so the worst term up there has a uh, p0 to the fourth coming out of the denominator, but then it has a 1 over p0 squared uh, helping you out in the numerator. And it has even more than that. So um, I can... Uh, explain this for you right here. Um, so if you take ci plus pi hat, um, I want to convince you that this term has a hidden cancellation that helps you reduce the power of these singularities in the denominator. Um, so you square it and you bound it above by c plus p hat squared, the whole thing, not just one term, and you expand this. Um, actually, you can just bound it above by 2 times 1 plus p hat dot c. Okay, so you expand that, you get c dot c plus p hat dot p hat plus uh, 2 uh, p hat dot c, and uh, the first two terms that I just spoke are bounded by 1, and so you get this bound, and so uh, the absolute value of ci plus p hat i is less than or equal to 1 plus p hat dot c to the 1 half. So you can automatically quickly reduce the uh, worst singularity in the et term uh, down to, from uh, 1 plus p hat dot c squared down to uh, 1 plus p hat dot c to the 1 half. So you, you kill a lot just by paying close attention to uh, the cancellation. Um, yeah, so, uh, but it, it may not look like there's a, as much cancellation uh, in the ES term. Um, it turns out that there is, and it's, uh, so this, uh, Delta ij minus p hat i p hat j term, term you can do something uh, sort of like this, not exactly, but you can get a similar type of thing if you're careful. And then what about this term, the cj minus c hat plus p hat pj? Can you get cancellation out of that? Yeah, you can. So um, let me just quickly show you. So you can add and subtract. So you write CJ plus P hat J minus P hat J 1 plus P hat hat C. You, you add and subtract uh, p hat j, and then you pull the p hat j out of the last term. And then um, this in absolute value is less than, by the previous calculation, 1 plus p hat dot c to the 1 half. Uh, so the, that's, that's the best, that's the the first term is the one half, the second term is one, but you just bound it above by the one half because it's easier, because it's smaller. Okay, so it turns out that the, there's even more going on in this uh, ES term um, than just these uh, cancellations. There, you have to split up into the uh, a term that contains good components from the good conservation law and the rest, um, and you can do that. But this is all I wanted to say about this right now. Um, okay, so now in 2D or in 2.5D, you have this uh, series of uh, works of Glassy Schaefer on 
global existence for large data. So you assume that the uh, conservation law, uh, the L2 norms in EMB, and the uh, P0F uh, is bounded initially. Oh, that should say F0 there, excuse me. Um, that's the initial F, it's not the uh, uh, F for all time. And so, so here you see uh, uh, what I've been saying. Um, if it, just briefly, let me return to the question from before. So if uh, in 2D you're integrating over a whole uh, solid region, and then you have these L2 conservation laws for E and B, this is stated as the initial data, but you can continue the bound for all time when you're integrating over a solid region. You can uh, bound from above the field by this conservation law when you're integrating over a uh, lower dimensional boundary of a cone like you are in 3D then you can't bound from above the um, terms by this uh, L2 conservation law so that's the thing that you're losing in 3D versus 2D. Okay so you have these uh, so let me return to the uh, existence theorem um, so you have the you assume that the L infinity norm is bounded you assume that the conservation laws are bounded, you assume that you have a compact support, so the soup of P such that the initial data is uh, non-zero is finite, um, and then you work in C in C0 and C1 and C2 spaces, uh, so and they really do work in uh, C1 and C2 spaces, not so below spaces, so you assume that F0 is C1 and E0 and B0 and C2, you assume all the constraints are satisfied, you assume uh, you're positive, and in uh, two and a half, you assume some additional things that I'm not mentioning. Um, then there exists a unique global and time C1 solution to the 2D uh, or two and a half T uh, relativistic class of Maxwell system, and uh, furthermore, the uh, fields grow. So the fields grow double exponentially in time. So this was um, the question from before about. Uh, you should have decay for the uh, wave equation. Uh, we don't have. We don't know decay. We know uh, from uh, glassy Schaefer. We know double exponential growth. Um, so that's that's a pretty strong, powerful growth in time of the L infinity norms of E and B. Uh, okay. So let me explain for you in one slide, just in a couple of minutes. Uh, again, I just want to give you a picture. I don't want you to understand. Uh, I'm not trying to explain this to you in too much detail. Um, but you, uh, this is a brief outline of glassy Schaefer's proof. So define the momentum support by P of T is 1 plus the soup over the absolute value of P uh, of all the uh, times where F is not 0 in all of backward time and in all of space. So this is the largest that the support ever was uh, going backwards in time from where you are now to zero. Um, and uh, then you decompose the field, the 2D field with the 2D ST decomposition. And then as I, you do L infinity estimates. So you bound the fields in the distribution function using a lot of uh, careful and hard uh, L infinity estimates. Um, and you prove that the support is bounded above by uh, the integral. So P of T is bounded above by a constant plus a constant uh, that depends on time plus the integral from 0 to T of uh, P of S, uh, log of P of S. And this is where you get the double exponential growth of the field. So um, if you study Gronwall, then you see that uh, something being bounded above by log log, uh, sorry, by itself times log of itself, not log log, is, uh, is double exponential growth. And if you want less than double exponential growth, then you need a better um, Gronwall. Um, and uh, Okay, so there's an additional conservation law. I told you about it before. And that's also uh, important in the uh, two and a half T proof. You have to use that uh, carefully. Um, and so this is what you get uh, for uh, 2D less of Maxwell um, in the um, 
relativistic case and two and a half T. It, it's worth pointing out that for existence and uniqueness, if you go to the non-relativistic case, then the situation is substantial is worse, you have to go to lower dimensions, so for non-relativistic, Fossil Maxwell, the characteristics can explode because uh, the velocities are um, not bound, the P, there's no p-hat, there's just v and v can go to infinity. Of course, you assume that the momentum support is finite, but initially, and you hope to prove that uh, for all time, but it's not as easy in one and a half t, and uh, the best results in the large are in one and a half d, and uh, there's a very recent paper by Glassy Pankovic Schaefer in this direction. Okay, so uh, again, I was since I want to give details, let me sort of briefly uh, explain uh, something more here. Um, so how do you get? Um, so you have the characteristics hmm, eraser. Okay, so these are the characteristics, uh, dx, ds, and dv, ds, and you can integrate the v uh, characteristic in time, um, and you get v of s t x p is less than or equal to v0 t x p plus The integral from zero to s d tau of okay. So I tried to write that briefly, um, but so uh, I wanted to answer the question on this board. Uh, how the heck do you bound the support? Um, and you bound the support using the uh, characteristics. Um, so these are the characteristics, and you integrate the V characteristic in time, and you slap absolute values on everything, and then you get this V characteristic is bounded above by the initial characteristic plus the absolute value of the uh, fields evaluated at T, at tau, and uh, the characteristic X. And now if you're bounded initially, uh, then, um, and if you can prove bounds for the fields, then uh, you can turn this into, you can take the soup over this V of S characteristic and get a bound for uh, P. So this, will, this V will turn into P, and then your, your hard work is to bound E and B, and you do that with L infinity estimates and uh, the ST decomposition and stuff like this. Okay, um, yeah. So let's continue. Okay, so uh, one of our goals uh, was to prove uh, existence and uniqueness in 2D without a compact support. And so this is the first theorem that I'm telling you about. Um, so we switch from CK spaces to Sobolev spaces and you consider initial data F0 in the Sobolev space H3, which is non-negative and obeys a bunch of bounds on the next slide. Don't worry about it yet. Um, and uh, your, your fields E and B are also in H3, so we don't really need to assume high regularity for the fields. Um, and you satisfy the constraints and you don't assume compactly supported initial data, then there exists a unique global in time C1 or H3 solution to Vlasa Maxwell in 2D or in 2.5D. This is a uh, joint work with Luke and you can get much better uh, growth of the field. It's still far away from what we want, but uh, exponential growth is uh, much lower than double exponential growth. And this is even sort of relevant uh, 
to uh, physical considerations when you think about uh, deriving the equation. Um, but so this is what we can do in uh, 2D and 2.5D, and, and it's also instructive of uh, what we do in 3D. Um, so here are the assumptions on the initial data. You have F0 is in L infinity, um, and uh, you have some high moment bound. Uh, for example, you assume that the L1 norms in X and uh, P of F with an nth moment are finite initially, where I say N is greater than 13. And you assume uh, a weighted L2 bound uh, for at least uh, three derivatives. Um, we actually do this in a scale of spaces, so you can go up to as many derivatives as you want. Uh, that's pretty standard, but uh, I'm just stating it here for three. Um, and then you have these funny uh, variation assumptions. I want to explain um, where they come from and why you use them. So um, let me, for every R, so furthermore, uh, you have the L infinity norm of X times the integral in dP of the soup of F0 of the variation of F0 near P and W less than or equal to R. That's uh, bounded by a constant that depends on R for every single R. Um, so, and you have a similar assumption for the gradient in X and P of F0, and you have a uh, similar assumption for uh, a gradient in X and P of the L infinity norms. Um, so why do we do this? This is, uh, this is the next thing I want to explain. Um, but so these assumptions are odd. Um, they're unusual, at least. So I want to explain why we do this. Before I do that, uh, let me just say, well, you can make simpler assumptions if you want. So uh, the previous uh, odd assumptions are, are implied if you assume that F0 is uh, sufficient decaying sufficiently rapidly, for example, minus 16 minus epsilon for some small epsilon, and if the gradient is pointwise decaying sufficiently rapidly, for example, like p0 to the minus 6 log to the minus 2. Uh, you could easily state these assumptions and, you'd, uh, and they'd be uh, less weird, but uh, they're, not, they're also significantly less general and they're not what you use. Um, and so I want to go back here and explain uh, how you use these assumptions. Um, okay, so uh, you can go back here to the characteristics. Um, and uh, so if you have compact support, you can uh, do this inequality. Um, if you don't have compact support, you can... Uh, you can't do this inequality anymore because this characteristic at zero is going to be uh, infinite. But you can still uh, try to uh, assume or prove that this integral is finite. Um, so you can uh, you can't uh, integrate the characteristics anymore, but you can still uh, use that intuition and try to. Uh, Say, well, what do you get if you assume that this uh, integral is finite? And uh, what you get um, in reverse order is uh, the following. So, um, so you integrate So you integrate from 0 to t, and then you get that uh, x0 txp minus x is less than equal to r over 2, say, and uh, v0 of txp minus p is less than equal to r prime over 2, or some Okay, so if you assume that this integral is bounded, then you can integrate the x 
and the V characteristics, and you can get that um, these kinds of bounds. So you have some constant which bounds the variation of uh, the characteristics. So uh, in 2D you can prove this bound, in 2.5D you can prove this bound, in 3D this bound is a conditional uh, assumption. And then when you integrate from 0 to T you can prove that the variation of the characteristics is controlled given that if you have a control of this uh, bound. Um, and then uh, you can use the characteristics um, again. So also So since the density satisfies the transport equation, uh, we talked about this last time, you can express the solution in terms of the initial data and the uh, characteristics. And uh, what you want to do is prove good bounds for uh, integrals involving f. So these assumptions give you uh, exactly what you need. Um, so from from 11 Okay, so it turns out that when you do these um, ST decompositions that I showed you for the field, you want to get estimates of various quantities involving F and integrals of F. One of those quantities, you have to believe me, is something like this. The integral over dP of P0 cubed F of T x P, and then you try to bound that in a space like L infinity in T over a finite interval and L infinity in X. And uh, so what do you do? Well, you plug in the expression that I put up here and you use assumption 11 and you, and you use uh, that these, these uh, quantities don't vary too much conditional on this assumption. So coming back to this assumption, you can prove that this, a quantity like this is bounded by one. Um, and that uh, is very uh, helpful. Um, and uh, in a similar way, you can prove uh, from from 13 that uh, Okay, so in a similar, I haven't told you what B of T is yet, I'm about to, but uh, from an assumption like 13, you can show that uh, the gradient of X and P, which is another quantity that comes up, if you take the L infinity norm of that, and you take a finite time interval, you take X and you take the P variable, then just using this expression, then you, in, then you differentiate it, you end up differentiating the characteristics, and you use that the variation uh, uh, the variations are bounded uh, and you use assumption 13 then you end up seeing that uh, the, a quantity like this is bounded above by uh, the maximum value of the first derivative of the backward characteristics so uh, b of t is 1 plus uh, the soup of the gradient um, x p of x and v. Mm. 
Okay, so here B is the, uh, just for simplicity, we write it as 1 plus the maximum over the backward characteristic. So it's the soup of the gradient in X and P of X and V, where your, the X's and V's are the backward uh, characteristics. So, uh, yeah, so I wanted to tell you what these assumptions are, and I wanted to tell you why you use them. So that's the story. Um, good. So that's how you use them. And uh, Okay, so the uh, similar theorem for 2.5T relativistic flux of Maxwell without compact support uh, uses the uh, additional conservation law in 2.5T. Although, since we're not assuming compact support, you have to, uh, or we use an assumption like this, um, that uh, the fifth plus some small delta moment um, in the P3 direction is bounded. So this is, this is actually a statement that you can prove because it's time dependent. But you, so you make an assumption similar to the ones I just explained on the board, and then you uh, can prove that it's propagated using the characteristics um, and using the conservation law. Okay, so for now that's all I, oh, oh I guess not. Um, so I'll give you a quick brief outline of the 2D and the 2.5T theorem. Um, so you bound the moments, uh, the nth, uh, the nth powers of F integrated instead of the supreme of the momentum support. Uh, many previous works rely heavily on uh, L infinity estimates, and uh, but that's L infinity estimates are a problem. So while the moments of F can be controlled by the L infinity norms of E and B, these L infinity norms of E and B cannot be controlled by the moments. So you have to do something else, um, and this is where you start to use LP estimates and uh, Strickart's estimates. Um, and in fact, in two uh, D. You don't just use Strickart's estimates, you use the improvement uh, of the standard Strickart's due to Fochi, Fochi, Fochi? Fosky. 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 excuse me. And Taggart is a, uh, Taggart a, a elaborated on uh, Fosky. Um, and so these uh, Fosky's uh, Strickart's estimates uh, in particular give you a, a better range of exponents in the case when you're working with uh, uh, a forced wave equation with zero initial data and so and that's exactly what the kind of situation that we're reducing to. Okay so Strickart's estimates capture the smoothing effect of the wave equation and give you better sort of long time asymptotics and that's why we get uh, better estimates in this situation and uh, I'll explain these techniques in more detail when we do the 3D case, so let's just jump right to that. Um, cause so again, uh, I won't read this slide carefully, but let me just remind you that you have the Glassy-Strauss theorem uh, that says that if uh, the uh, support of the distribution function remains bounded and it doesn't grow to infinity, then uh, you can continue the solution indefinitely. Um, and the question is, can you uh, have a continuation criterion in 3D that does not involve the uh, momentum support or does not involve compactly supported functions? And making that assumption initi initially, it seems like a strong assumption to make considering that you're working with a relativistic model that's supposed to uh, uh, be, be a better model for large velocities, um, for large momentum. But, uh, okay, so uh, again, we come back to uh, this kind of thing that I wrote on the board over here. So if you let P of T be the uh, momentum support um, that I explained to you previously, that, and you have the characteristics again uh, for X and V, and uh, if uh, P0 is finite, then uh, the continuation criteria that the... Um, Momentum support remains finite is equivalent to this condition uh, that the fields remain bounded, um, which is also what we wrote over here. Um, on the other hand, that you can assume that the fields, the, the L1 integral of the fields along the characteristics remain bounded even without assuming that the momentum support is a compact. Um, I, there's a hidden uh, 
TXMP in these slides that I'm not mentioning. And this is what we do. So 17, uh, this condition makes sense even when the momentum support is not compact. And uh, so that's what you can do. Okay, so um, now I'll state a theorem. Uh, so given uh, initial data, we satisfy the uh, constraints on the divergences and given uh, the initial data is in a weighted uh, H, Sobolev space HD, where D is like greater than four. Um, then you can prove a local existence theorem. Uh, and uh, here the weight is just P zero to the three over two log of one plus P. It's used for uh, technical reasons in the local existence theorem. You need some decay. Um, and then if you assume this condition uh, on the uh, L1 integral of the field of long characteristics, then uh, if the bound 17 holds up to time t, uh, then you can continue your local solution um, further past t. So uh, this is uh, a continuation criterion. Um, that's the theorem. So you can continue your solution beyond t, and the solution stays in the Sobolev spaces <coughs> hd. Um, so you can, you can continue the solution up to time t plus epsilon for any small epsilon, and if you have a bound like this for all t, then uh, you have a global solution because you have a solution that exists for any large amount of time. Okay, so uh, there are similar assumptions in uh, 3D, so I won't spend as much time on them. Um, it's a little bit different, so you assume the infinity norm is bounded, you assume some moment, some uh, collection of moments are bounded. Uh, I didn't go back and calculate it. Um, but it's, it's not that big, it's like 15 or something. Um, and you assume that some the Sobolev norms in L2 based Sobolev norms are finite here. We, we use d greater than or equal to 4. We haven't uh, done any like low regularity type work. We're just doing the basic uh, Sobolev local existence theorem. Um, and you have related uh, crazy assumptions. Again, I, I definitely don't want you to write down this slide. Um, but um, I just want to show it to you. And I, I explained it more carefully in the 2D case because it's easier to explain in that case. But these are the sort of brutal assumptions that you use. There are the 2D analogs of the 3D assumptions. You have certain norms. And you assume that the variation of these uh, functions initially is not too big. Um, you assume it's controllable, it doesn't blow up. So for every r, there's a different constant cr, such that these uh, things are finite, where you soup over uh, the variation away from a point. And then that allows you to uh, control the characteristics. Um, Okay, so here is a uh, quick uh, outline of the proof. Um, you uh, quick outline of the local part of the proof. So you prove local existence via standard energy estimates in HK. The local proof uh, immediately implies that the solution may, remains regular in 3D if this quantity is bounded. So you can remain regular beyond capital T if this integral is bounded up to T. So you have the L-infinity norm of uh, the fields, the first derivative of the field and the second derivative of the fields. You have to, for some reason, we have to use L3. And then we have the uh, L infinity L2 norm of the weighted uh, first derivatives of the distribution function f. So this is an automatic continuation criterion that comes out of the local existence theorem. Um, and then you assume that 17 remains bounded, where 17 is, again, the uh, L1 norm of the integral of the fields of long characteristics. And then um, you show that this integral implies this continue, this the bound um, of E and B up to uh, time t uh, integrated along the characteristics implies uh, the, uh, the continuation criterion that comes directly out of the local existence theorem. It's 26, that's the integral. So this one, look, this one is significantly more general and easier to use, so you basically reduce to it. Um, OK, so yes. Was there oh, no one said anything? OK. Um, <laughs> so uh, now I was planning to switch to the blackboard. 
but uh, I don't know if I'll have time to really say everything. Um, uh, let's try. Yeah. Um, okay, so we can start in the middle. Okay, so we let b of t be uh, the soup over everything of the first derivative of the backward characteristics. And you let f of t be, say so we're basically estimating the characteristics. So you have the soup that B of T is the soup over the backward characteristics and F of T is the soup over the forward characteristics. Um, and now you have the characteristics up here. So it's, uh, it's basically automatic um, that you have an estimate like Okay, so uh, the forward characteristics can be bounded by, this is the ds integral, um, and this is l infinity x. So the forward characteristics, uh, if, you do, if you integrate both of them and you take a derivative, um, and uh, it's just a straightforward calculation that you can bound the forward characteristics by uh, a constant uh, times uh, the integral of the forward characteristics times the L-infinity norm of the field. Uh, I use the middle one first, right? OK. And um, the goal is to bound the field. So then uh, st decomposition I bound for OK, so I claim that if you combine the ST decomposition, the assumed bound for E and B, and Grunwall, you get a horrible bound for K.
Okay, so uh, I claim that um, you have this estimate, and uh, you'll just have to believe me or read the paper. Um, so uh, you can bound, uh, you can use ST decomposition, you can use the assume, assume bound for the. Um, so remember, we're trying to bound um, K itself, the first derivative of K, and the second derivative of K. I'm only going to explain to you how to bound the first derivative of K. Uh, because then we're going to run out of time. And um, I'll explain how to, how to bound k itself uh, tomorrow. And uh, so you get this bound. So you get the P3F moment, um, and you get the P3 gradient XPF moment, and then you get this delta parameter that comes out of uh, estimating a singular part <coughs> of the integrals. And and uh, so, how do we so how do we estimate uh, these terms? This is a homework problem. <laughs> Except that I already told you the answer. Um, okay, so you use the assumptions. Um, so these crazy assumptions that I told you about are useful, and uh, so by the assumptions. Then, uh, yeah, P zero three F L infinity uh, P L infinity X L one P is less than or equal to one. Um, I need new chalk. Okay, so by the assumption by this. Assumption and by the assumptions on the uh, initial data, these crazy variation assumptions that I asked, uh, that I uh, showed you, and by the uh, method that I showed you to use those uh, crazy assumptions to estimate things like this, you estimate that, and um, also. Okay, so again, by the assumptions, you can show that uh, p cubed uh, gradient xp and uh, gradient xp by itself is bounded above by uh, the characteristics, um, by the uh, backward uh, characteristics, um, by the soup of them. And then um, also. By a very nice uh, matrix calculation that I like, but it's not so original. Um, you can bound the backward characteristics by a power of the forward characteristics, and you can bound the forward characteristics by a power of the backward characteristics using. Uh, you just take the determinant of one and use the properties of characteristics and. Uh, use uh, Kramer's rule and you get that you can bound one by the other. And then, um, okay, so you plug all this in and uh, we, we go back to the top. Um, so we have f of t is bounded by integral f of s, gradient uh, k of s, and we have gradient of k is bounded by all this stuff. And we have p0 cubed l1 is bounded by 1. And we have P0 cubed gradient XL1 is bounded by B, um, and um, we have an extra bound for gradient XPF that I just stated. Then uh, choose delta of T equal to T over B of T. Now you know why I wrote B of T as 1 plus the soup, uh, because I want delta to be between 0 and T. 
And so you choose this delta, and then you get uh, f of t is less than or equal to 1 plus the integral from 0 to t of f of s log b of s t s. Okay, so now if the log wasn't there, you'd be dead. Um, you wouldn't be able to do anything. But since the log is, so now we're going to bound b of t by f of t and pull out the constant. Um, Okay, so uh, this is uh, what you do. Um, so what we've shown here is that f is bounded. The soup of the characteristics is bounded. And then um, b is also bounded. So we see that uh, f of t is uniformly bounded, and then b of t is also uniformly bounded, uh, double exponentially growing, but still uniformly bounded. Uh, so the forward characteristics and the backward characteristics are both uniformly bounded. And then um, This is bounded, and this is bounded, uh, and that's bounded. So everything is bounded. So therefore, gradient x, k, at infinity t is bounded. So we're just sort of moving around in a circle, but not exactly doing doing slightly non-circular logic, so we prove uh, some things are bounded and then uh, go back to the previous inequality and use it again to prove that the thing is actually bounded instead of just Cronwall. Um, okay, so, k, so gradient k is bounded uh, because of all these other bounds. And then also uh, w3 gradient xp f in um, say L1 T L infinity X L2 P is less than or equal to um, Now you see why I did the L infinity bound for gradient XPF. Okay, so you can do an interpolation. Uh, this is the, this W3 gradient XP uh, L1 L infinity X L2P is the thing that we want to bound to have a continuation criteria. But we haven't shown that that's bounded. All we've shown is that uh, P0 cubed gradient XP and that norm is bounded and the gradient x, p, and f in that norm is bounded. Previously, you didn't know why I put this norm here. It was just an odd thing, but now you know why. It's because uh, you can interpolate for some theta between these two norms and see that this quantity is bounded. So then uh, that's how it works. Um, OK, so uh, you can do a similar. Um, type of argument for the second derivative of k and um, then you have um, you almost have the continuation criteria the only thing missing is this um, 
you have having to prove this uh, bound that the uh, the integral along characteristic is is finite in 3D. That's a uh, assumption that you don't know that we don't know how to prove. That if you could prove that, you'd solve the big problem. Um, in uh, 2D and 2.5D, and I haven't explained to you how to prove it. And uh, it's uh, it involves uh, bounding the moments and. Uh, it involves uh, using strict arts estimates, and uh, I will uh, explain it to you on uh, tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions? So in your local existence theorem, you yes. solved it in a, with, well, with a weights in the momentum, and yes. which is um, P naught to a three halves log of one plus P naught. Yes. Okay. So I'm sure it's kind of wondering, like, do you expect these to be optimal or? Uh no. Um. I don't expect it to be optimal. I uh. Excellent. We made no effort other than uh, using the smallest thing that worked in order to uh. In use that weight. Um. The the idea is that you do uh. Holders inequality in certain places, and when so you basically you take the equation, you hit it with a bunch of derivatives, and you multiply it by the solution uh, with the same number of derivatives, and you integrate, and then you get something that resembles an L2 norm minus a bunch of other stuff, and you have to control the other stuff, and you, to control the other stuff, you use uh, Sobolev embedding theorems, you use holders inequality, and you use all the various other tools that uh, people normally do to prove local existence. And uh, at one point, you need to control an integral in a holder's inequality to get from an L1 norm to an L2 norm. And uh, at that step, you p0 to the 3 halves uh, log of 1 plus p0 is just barely bigger than p0 to the minus 3, and it's enough to control an, a three-dimensional integral. And that's why we use that weight. OK, thanks. So, so tomorrow, I'll talk about the uh, bound for k. And I'll talk about further uh, the state of the art, uh, as I know it, for continuation criteria for uh, 3D less of Maxwell. And uh, most of it will be on the board. There'll be some uh, more proofs. OK, thank Very you.